Hello, I'm Hang Chen Yu. I'm presenting a work done in University of Texas at Austin on accelerator fertilization. In recent years, we have seen two conflicting trends. First, due to the end of Moore's law, lots of new specialized accelerators are um, designed for better performance and energy efficiency. Many of them have been deployed in data centers. Second, a lot of workloads such as machine learning are migrating to the cloud for the for the elastic infrastructure. Multiple tenants are consolidated on the same servers to amortize costs and improve resource utilization. However, there comes a problem. The cloud infrastructure relies on virtualization technique, but hypervisors are not keeping pace with the emerging accelerators. Here are the numbers of accelerators and virtualized accelerators since 2010, and we can see the numbers, the, the gap between those two numbers. Current accelerator virtualization support is, um, is not very good. They have fundamentally difficult design space trade-offs. And accelerators in the cloud are usually dedicated to a single tenant. They aren't shared among different VMs and are often underutilized. Here are three properties that a well-designed virtualization system must have. First, it needs efficient interposition to virtualize the software or hardware interfaces. Second, it should be compatible on different devices, operating systems, and framework libraries. And third, applications in different virtual machines shouldn't affect each other's safety or performance. Many existing systems virtualize accelerators. Most of them are GPUs, and they use different techniques. Most of them require massive engineering effort, and all of them compromise at least one of those virtualization properties. Our paper summarizes those virtualization systems in the related work section, and please refer our paper and related citations for details. In the next slide, I will show the minimal background that you need to know and to understand this talk. Here is the overview of a modern accelerator stack. It includes many different layers, such as APIs, user library, and device driver. To virtualize the hardware, we need to interpose one or more interfaces in this stack. However, most of these interfaces are proprietary, and they are hard or impossible to be imposed, interposed. We call, this, we call it silo, as we can't break it and see its internals. However, the public API that we found is well-defined, usually well-documented, and all allows a relatively infrequent interposition. So we found that the API layer is the only one practical point for interposition. And interposing the API layer has very long history. The technique is called API remoting and is well explored. Here is the architecture of API remoting system. The custom user mode library communicates with the API server and it forwards all applications API calls to the API server. Then the API server executes those APIs and sends back the results to the guest library. This design is very straightforward, but it has two major problems. First, because the guest library communicates directly with the, the API server, so there is no hypervisor in the position, and we can't enforce resource policies by hypervisor. Second, we need to implement the guest library and API server per supported API. So the API compatibility is poor. We implemented an OpenCL library remoting system uh, manually, which took us ab about three months. But then we tried to support CUDA APIs, and which still took us over a month. For the first problem, the hypervisor interposition, we need to enable hypervisor interposition and enable hypervisor to enforce resource policies. We solved this problem by remoting APIs through hypervisor and we introduced a parallel virtual transport device to forward the APIs. And we can um, implement different features and optimizations in the transport device. 
And in this way, the whole API remoting process is under the control of the hypervisor. And we can enforce different resource policies in the hypervisor. And for the compatibility problem, our solution is to compensate the API compatibility by reducing the developer effort for virtualizing an API. So our solution is to introduce a compiler to generate this virtualization stack automatically. And so that the developer doesn't require lots of effort to build the virtualization stack. And because we generate code for API remoting, the automated generation must be based on the semantic information provided by the API. But how can we manage the implicit state that is missing from the API semantics? And how can we specify resource policies which are usually not part of the API semantics? And our solution is to introduce a new specification language to describe API semantics and resource policies. AFA is designed out of these ideas. It's, it uses a single technique to virtualize many accelerators, APIs, and policies, and supports features that are on two flow with current SRLV, the hardware virtualization, and API remoting systems. AVA has efficient hypervisor interposition and enforces flexible resource policies, and it enables automatic construction of virtual stacks starting from the native API header file. This talk will focus on how we virtualize various accelerators by a single technique and with minimal developer effort. This is the whole picture of AVA. We designed a new language, Lapus, short for low-level API semantics to describe API semantics and policies. We also implemented a compiler, Kava, uh, which is the compiler for Lapis and, uses, and is used to generate professional Lapis spec and API-specific components in the virtualization stack. The guest library, so in this figure, and API server are generated by Kava. And there is a router running along with the hypervisor to enforce the policies specified in the policy in the in the spec. And here is the workflow of using Kava and Lapis to generate the stack and make virtualization easier. So we start from the API header and header file for CUDA APIs, and we import this header file to Kava. Then Kava will generate a preliminary guest API spec for us. And then the developer can correct or change this spec and input the corrected spec to Kava again. And then Kava can help us generate the, the actual API stack automatically. And there are hundreds and lines of code generated for each function. Lapis allows us to address a range of challenges of API virtualization. It can express the core and argument transfer required by an existing API, including implicit API state. The compiler can then generate communication stub, much like other systems. It also expresses resource accounting and sharing policies, as well as state capture for live migration. Let's compare this with network file system, which um, also forwards an API to access an OS resource. Notable differences are marked in bold. However, NFS changed the API by using the virtual file system layer and making sure that layer doesn't have any implicit state. This means that the NFS approach is not capable of forwarding existing APIs while Ava and Lapis can forward existing APIs. Further, NFS does not support virtualization-specific features like migration and swapping. Some CUDA APIs introduce asynchronous dependencies. The application invokes the asynchronous man copy API, which returns before the GPU buffer is fully copied to CPU. Before it uses the CPU buffer, it needs to call a synchronization API to guarantee that the copy has completed. So these APIs introduce a asynchronous dependency between the CPU buffer and the synchronization API. 
In Ava, we introduced an additional caching layer called shadow buffering to hold the asynchronous copies. The guest library forwards the asynchronous main copy API to the API server, and it returns before the GPU buffer is fully copied to the shadow buffer. Later, the synchronization API is forwarded and synchronizes the shadow buffer. When this API returns, we must make sure that this asynchronous dependency is resolved and the shadow buffer is copied to guest library. The dependency information is also missing from the API semantics, and how can we describe this dependency as well as shadow buffering with Lapis? And let's first look at how Lapis describes resource usage and policy. And in the spec, we can declare different types of resource um, in the spec. For example, we can declare device memory as a continuous resource. The continuous resource means that this kind of resource is held by the, the application for a period of time. And we can then annotate a, an API to allocate or consume a specific size of this kind of resource. Then we can import policy code for this resource to the spec. And the policy code looks like this, and it can be either a Linux module or an eBPF program, and we won't this and discuss the, the details of the spec of the policy code in this talk. And here is how we manage the asynchrony in, uh, in the spec. So um, in the spec, we can define any data structures um, or utility functions written in C. And here we define a list of outstanding asynchronous dependencies, and which is a list and we also define a utility function to register those dependencies to the list. And because this API um, is used to copy the memory from device to host asynchronously, so we need to specify the semantics of early return value. And, and the return, default return value is CUDA success for this API. Then we need to annotate the shadow buffer, and here we can manage the shadow buffer's lifetime in the spec. And as last, we expose the outstanding asynchronous dependencies to the list, and we will um, put transfer this in implicit state to the to the API server. And this API is used to synchronize um, the CUDA program at some point in the during the execution and we define more, a, more utility functions to manage the shadow buffers. And because the outstanding asynchronous dependencies um, are implicit states, so we need, to, we need a way to transfer it from guest library to API server. And we can also use those ex utility functions to get the numbers of those buffers or those shadow buffers and also the sizes of those buffers. And then we can synchronize those buffers and transfer them back to the guest library. Now let's move to the evaluation of Ava. We have used Ava to virtualize um, nine accelerators and 11 framework APIs, and seven of them were not virtualized before. And we also found most of them can be virtualized in a few days or a few weeks, which is much faster than the existing virtualization systems. And we also measured the end-to-end -end performance of AFA, and we run a lot of different benchmarks. And we can find most of them have close to native performance. And also some of those benchmarks have non-trivial overheads because they are data or core intensive. And that means they have a lot of API calls or move a lot of data during a small period. Uh, However, we run the same benchmarks on the, on the existing systems, and we found AVA is still four times faster than a commercial product, and is even much faster than other virtualization systems. So as a conclusion, we use AVA to demonstrate that we can use a single technique to virtualize many different accelerators and APIs. And we also show that a single developer can use Ava to virtualize a new API or accelerator in just a few days or a few weeks. 
We have open sourced our project on GitHub. And if you are interested in Ava, please refer those codes. And thank you for listening to this talk.